tonight, I want to bring you a message of hope. You know, uh, the other day I was sitting, I was bent over my Bible, I was looking through it, and uh, deeply studying over it, and I was preparing for the next message. Uh, one of my boys come in, he looked at me, and he kind of looked at me kind of strange and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm preparing. And he looked at kind of a sly grin on his face because I've been preaching through Revelation so long. He said, what are you preparing for, the end? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I kind of guess I am, you know. I've been preparing for the end for a long, long time. I've uh, been studying over these things in Revelation for a long, long time. And you know, uh, the question is, how does it all end? How does it all end? It ends wonderful for the Christian folks. It ends wonderful for the Christian. Many will tell you that the end can't be discovered. You can't know what the end really means. They'll tell you when you get to Revelation, it's all a bunch of gobbledygook. None of it fits together. But as we went through Revelation, we've seen over and over again, it was all written over in the Old Testament. Everything was already written and already prepared for that was going to be written right here. And if we just read those books of the Bible that aren't on our uh, morning devotions, you know, they don't put those on the special plaques at the Lifeway. Um, the verses that we've been looking over, if you just look at them, God will reveal to us the truth of what that is. In Revelation 20, I, I can't read it in any plainer language what happens there in Revelation 20. And I've been asked time and again, is there a thousand year reign of Christ? How can I not believe? That there's a thousand year reign of Christ. It says it in plain English. This chapter here, it isn't just here, it's all over the scripture, but this chapter here that I'm going to go through here tonight, these just first ten verses is all I want to look at tonight, but as we go through this, you're going to see this doesn't sound like some kind of a metaphor. It isn't something made up. This is a narrative. It is an actual story being told to you exactly. Now, there were places in this that we've looked at, and it looked like it was a metaphor for this. Like the lady was up in heaven, and she was pregnant, and she was birthed with a child, and there was a dragon and all this. We understood that was a metaphor. It was symbolism. It was images. But this isn't symbolism. This is very direct. This is very clear about what you're about to read and what you're about to understand. It kind of reminds me about how people look at this as they look at joy to the world. Joy of the world. For once, I'm going to tell you not to open up your Bibles, but your uh, song books to chapter, uh, chapter, uh, <laughs> page 408. Uh, so turn over there for just a second. Page 408. Listen to what this says. It, it's often characterized as a Christmas hymn. It says, Joy of the world, the Lord has come. Well, that's about as close as you can get to the Christmas hymn. Because after that, it says, Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing. No more let sin and sorrow grow. Now at the, at the crucifixion and at the uh, birth of Jesus Christ, is sin and sorrow still growing in the world? Yes. Yeah. But one day it won't be. It won't be in this second coming when Christ returns and he sets up this kingdom. No thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. He's going to take the curse, the curse of sin, the curse that is in nature itself, and change it all the way around where he makes it new again. New again. And then, the sad part of this whole story, at the end of it, people will still rebel. Many people look at that joy of the world. They don't see, they can't understand that that's not a Christmas hymn. I'm not telling you not to sing it at Christmas by no means. It's great to sing at Christmas because we're looking forward to what's coming, right? We're looking ahead to what's about to occur. In another place where they try to make um, it about Christmas, but it's not necessarily about Christmas, is Isaiah chapter 9. If you'll turn over to Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to come back to Revelation 20, I promise you. But I want you to stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God tonight in Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Now, as far as we get with Christmas, and then it says, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And there will be peace in this day for a thousand years. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. It's not going to end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal 
of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You may be seated. Now, as I said, that isn't about Christmas either. It's talking about when Jesus returns. We talked about he came back this morning. This, he didn't come back this morning. But we preached about him coming back this morning. He came back and he cleaned house. He separated all these things from off the world. And he sets up his millennial reign here in Revelation chapter 20. You can go over there. <coughs> I want us to look tonight as four different events that will walk us through the narrative of Revelation chapter 20. Uh, when I was first learning to drive, back in 19 so-and-so, a little yeah. while back, I had to pick things out as I was driving around. I had to notice there were these markers to help me find my way to here to there. Well, the same thing can be done here in Revelation chapter 20. There are markers that you can see that walk you through a thousand years. You know, it's amazing how you can read Scripture and there will be a thousand years take place in just a few ten verses, right? Uh, but anyway, the first marker that I want you to see here is the binding of Satan and the cleansing of physical evil. Look here at verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon. We all know who that is, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, it didn't. Is that not a thousand years? Is that not what it says? A thousand years? And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up <coughs> and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now right here, if you look back at verse 21, we realize that the false prophet and the beast are placed in the lake of fire. But that is not where the Satan is placed at. He is taken away from the world. Can you imagine a world without the devil in it? A world without the devil. We've never known it, have we? We've grown up, we've lived all our lives with this idea of the devil being amongst us. But in that day, he'll be locked up. That'll be the first time he's ever been locked up. People claim he's the, the leader of hell. By no means is he the leader of hell. He, the scripture says he roams back and forth seeking whom he may devour upon this planet. That's what he's doing right now. He goes wherever he wants. Now, he's not um, omnipresent as God is. He's not everywhere all at once, but he has these demons that work with him. But in this day, it says that they, he, they will take him. The angel will come down. Uh, there's many different ideas about who that angel is, uh, but we do know that it says an angel will come down with the key of the bottomless pit. This is where they're going to put him at, the bottomless pit. Now, where did we last hear that? Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, right? In Revelation chapter 9, we realize that the, that the devil had this key beforehand. He says he come down as a star and he opened up this bottomless pit. At that time, he opened up that bottomless pit and all the demons that had been trapped in there from, from ages ago, God had had these trapped in this same pit, came loose upon the earth and covered it over for a period of time during the tribulation period. Now, this is that pit also the demons feared. You remember when uh, Jesus uh, had the man come up to him who was filled with a legion of devils? He was filled with them. And it, the, the, he said, I'm going to cast you out. And he says, I'll cast you into these swine. They go in the swine. That swine jump off of the, uh, the cliff. That's in Luke chapter 8, verse 30. A at that time, Jesus talked to them. And Jesus asked him, he said, what is thy name? And he said, legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him. Listen what they besought, what they wanted that he would not command them to go down into the deep abyss. That is the same word for this pit, this, this spiritual place where, uh, where the demons are being held at. Now in the scripture, it also talks about the story of rich man, the rich man and Lazarus. That, that rich man was put in this place called hell, and Lazarus was put in this place called Abraham's bosom. From what I understand from the scripture, Jesus came and he released the people out of Abraham's bosom when he rose from the grave. But that place of hell, that compartment is there. It said there was this great chasm between the two of them. And it would seem that this is the idea of this pit, this place where they're kept. This is a spiritual thing, you understand, folks? I heard one guy, he tried to explain it this way. And he explained it as it being in the heart of the earth, in the center of it. He said, there's that hot place in the center of the earth, but when you fall, you can't fall to the bottom because gravity would catch you in the sense of it, and it would be a bottomless pit. And he uh, put those ideas in that. But I don't believe it's just a physical thing. I believe it's a spiritual thing. It, it's beyond your comprehension right now. You understand what I'm saying? But um, if you die without Christ, you'll open your eyes there. You'll open your eyes there in one of those compartments to the side, that place of hell as we have known it as here today. Hell, a 
place of darkness, a place of burning. And it, Satan will be cast into this, this pit that the Scripture tells about it. Everything else, though, will be cast into the furnace of fire. Everything's going to be burned up at this time. They're going to cast it away. All the physical earth here is being cleansed of all evil so Christ can have this thousand-year reign actually occur. Now, I don't know if we can fully comprehend what a physical world would look like without sin, but that's what it'll be. Can you comprehend that? Can you get a, your mind placed around it? Now, when we talked about Matthew chapter 13, we talked about the harvest at the end of the world, and we talked about the angels being the reapers. And there it talked about how they would go forth and the tares would be gathered and burned and set in the fire. And so shall it be at the end of this world, is what Jesus said. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather all, out of his kingdom all things that offend, that's the first thing, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. First thing, all things that offend. All things that offend. Now think about that for a second. What offends God? What offends God that is in your possession right now that won't be in that millennial kingdom? Somebody says, uh, computers. God's going to take all the computers away. Well, I don't think a computer offends God. I think it's just a tool that, that can be used by one. What clothing do you have that would offend God. I believe the angels are going to come and take that type of clothing and take it away. What type of uh, things do you have? You know, What are things that offend? What CD? Think about this. I don't think God will take the casting crowns or the gates of CD because they're giving glory to Him. But what will He take? Will He take those ones that curse that you might have in your home right now? Those ones that use His name in vain? That say GD over and over again? Will those things be taken that day? Well, I sure do believe they will be. That would be something that would offend God, right? What is in your home that will be gone in the millennium? Why would you want something in your home that will offend God? That God will have to literally send His angels out to go ahead and carry it out and throw it out in the street. Think about that for a minute. He's going to go through and He's going to wipe out all things that offend. Books, the websites that are out here. <clears throat> all things that offend. All things that have their sole purpose and what we talked about a few Sundays ago, the religion of Babylon or the rebellion of Babylon. All of the false worship will be gone. It'll be carried out. It'll be thrown away in that day. Everything. What do you hold to, folks? Think about it. What do you hold to that you won't have to live in that thousand year reign of Christ? What physical things on this earth are precious to you that you think you've got to have? Oh, I've got to have this. I've got to have that. But they would offend God. If they would offend God, why? Why, Christian, don't they offend you? Right? That hurts. Boy, that hurt my shin. Something awful, didn't you? Yeah. That's tough. But that's the truth. What offends God? And why would we hope? Why would we care for that thing? Because... God tells me that in this millennial reign, everything's going to be perfect. And I have an imperfect place if I still hold on to these imperfect things that offend God. And them which do iniquity was the second thing. Well, the one, the big one who does iniquity is that devil. He's going to be thrown out. But there'll also be those who took the mark, those who didn't receive Jesus as their Savior. You can read about that when he talks about the sheep and the goat judgment. He separates them out, and some of them go off into the fire. Those people who will not trust in Christ. Everyone who will walk into that millennial kingdom in that day will be a follower of Jesus Christ, who is a physical human being. And those who are in their spirit, spiritual glorified bodies, like me and you, if you're a saved individual here tonight, you'll already be saved, so it won't matter. But all the physical, only physical Christians. Can you imagine a world where there's only Christians and you know everybody's a Christian? There's no doubt about it. Everybody's a Christian walking in there in that day. I can't imagine this. I mean, it's, it's beyond your mind. The next signpost you come through after this cleansing of all this physical evil is the physical reign of Jesus Christ. This is a physical reign. This is actually happening as we have hands and feet and stuff and we can move and we can touch things. This is the physical reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> he says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It says that again. What about that? 
But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This must occur. This has to occur. This isn't some metaphor. This isn't some uh, thing up in somebody's head. This is the actual physical time to fulfill the physical promise to the physical Jews when the Lord will reign physically on this earth. Can I be clearer than that? It's when He's physically going to be here. It will be a time of perfect peace prophesied all the way back in Micah 4, 1 through 3. It talks about how He will be uh, uh, have a perfect, peaceful government. I'm going to read these verses to you now. Write them down. Go back to them when you get feeling bad. Thinking things, boy, things are so sorry. Think about the next day. Think about what's coming in the future. When, when all these things are passed away, all these hard things are gone, think about this. Micah 4. <clears throat> but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let's go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths. Everybody wants to know about Jesus in this day. For the law shall go forth of Zion. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Jesus is in charge in Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people. And rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's a, a passage that is written atop of the United Nations. But they ain't accomplishing that, are they? The United Nations aren't going to accomplish that. There's only one who will accomplish that. It's Jesus Christ, the Lord. The Lord. Not only that, a, a government peace, there'll be a physical peace. Now this is beyond your mind. <laughs> I'm going to pick on Misty. She can get after me later. <laughs> Misty loves animals. And she will put some of the, I mean, I, I tell her, honey, put those two animals there, they're going to eat each other alive, right? I said, don't do that, honey. Don't put those two animals together. And I, for a couple of times, I thought we may have to pull them apart because of what might happen. But she just believes all animals should get along together, you know. They should all be loving to one another because they're so cute and cuddly, you know. But in that day, it doesn't matter what animal that you bring, they're all going to be peaceful together. This is what it says in Isaiah 11, 6 through 7. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. You try that today and see what happens, folks. It ain't going to happen, is it? The wolf ain't going to dwell with the lamb too nicely. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. That's not the little kid, that's the goat. He won't eat it. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead him. A little child will come along like, like cadence there and walk along with lions and lambs or lions and leopards. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Imagine a cow and a bear feeding together. And their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. You see, the curse will be overturned in that day. It'll go back to the way God originally created with the animals eating the, eating the grass, just like the lion here eats like the ox. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? The peace of that? No more murder, no more killing, no more uh, bloodshed in that way. No lion, no lamb either. You know, they say they're lion and lamb, but you never find that in the Scripture. Not only that, it'll be a time of perfect justice. Listen to this from Isaiah 11, 3 through 4. And it shall make of him quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Nobody will get away with nothing. I mean, those physical people who are still on this earth, they won't get by with nothing because God will rule them with a wrought iron. As soon as they have the sin, as soon as they do the wrong, judgment will come. There won't be this sitting in five, 20 years waiting to go to the electric chair, you'll go to it in a second. Because God knows. In the fear of the Lord is what it says. And he shall not judge after sight of his eyes, neither approve after the hearing of his ears. God won't go by, by what he sees or what he hears. He'll just know. He'll know. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips and shall he slay the wicked. You know how he wiped out those ones we talked about this morning in Armageddon with the sword of his mouth? In that day, it'll be like that when they rebel against him at any point. Not only will there be perfect justice, but there'll also be perfect abundance. More than we can possibly imagine or think. All that we need. It says here in Isaiah, 
<clears throat> chapter 35, 1 and 2. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice, and the blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and sing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. They'll be going out here in the desert and growing great big crops. Anything will grow that you want. You know, if you don't have a green thumb today, you're going to have one then. It'll grow. Everything, abundance, food for all. You won't see these little starving children over in Africa with their bellies swelled because God will make sure that everybody gets something to eat. Everybody. We won't have to worry about people being homeless and not having a place to go to. Jesus will make a way for everybody to be taken care of in that day. My goodness, what a day that will be. What a day that will be. And that's for you, my friend. That's for you and me. We get to be in this kingdom. There'll be perfect healing. In Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. How many people, do, have you ever known a blind person? They've never been able to see, and all of a sudden their eyes will be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be stopped. No deaf person, no blind person. Then shall the lame leap as a heart. No person that can't get up and walk. And the tongue of the dumb sing. The people who weren't able to talk, they'll be able to speak. For in the wilderness shall break out streams in the desert. No physical disability in that day. Everyone will be perfectly protected by God in that sense. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? That God will, will bring that curse out of the way. <coughs> the curse is what causes these things, folks. To be joy. Joy like none other. Isaiah 55, 12. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now I don't believe the trees of the field are going to clap their hands. But it does say that nature shall rejoice and heaven and nature sing. Right? That's what it's saying. That's what's going to occur in that day. This day when this thousand year reign takes place. And what kind of job do you get in that day, folks? Is there work for y'all during that day? Well, yes, there is. It says here that he gives thrones to people. Who does he give those thrones to? He gives them to the saints of all the ages. All the saints of all the ages. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. It says there, Do ye not know that the saints, the set apart ones, shall judge the world? Well, when are they going to do that if it ain't in the thousand year reign of Christ? Uh, the, all the lay, back in the Laodicean believers, Revelation 3.21, the church age that I believe we're in now, it says very clearly, to him that overcometh, that is not uh, lukewarm, that's uh, either cold or hot, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down my Father in his throne. We will rule with Christ in that day, in our, in our glorified bodies. The disciples, uh, Matthew 19, 27 through 28, they were feeling so bad for themselves. They were saying, oh Lord, we gave up everything to follow you. We gave up all these different things. We struggled and we went through all this different stuff. What do we have? Jesus looks at him. Verily. It means amen. Listen. Verily. Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. When's that going to happen? The thousand year reign of Christ. Hosea, all the Old Testament saints, David's going to come back. He's going to be a king over there in that day. King David. For the children of Israel, Hosea 3, 4 and 5, For the children of Israel shall by many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without a teraphim, all those things that they used to have for their worship, all those things that they used to have as a king. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God. See, that hadn't happened yet. That's going to happen. And David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. King David be walking around with you that day. You got some questions for King David? He'll answer them. Moses, Elijah, walking around in that day. Wouldn't it be something, folks, to see these people? And it's all those people who are gathered into that first resurrection that talks about there in Revelation 20. There are, these are those who are in it. The first resurrection, you've got to understand, begins with Jesus. Now, how do you know that, Scott? If you look over in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26, it says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But every man in his own order. You want to hear the order? Here's the order. Christ the first fruits. That's the first part of the first resurrection. And then it goes on afterward. They there are Christ at his coming. It starts with the rapture. 
The Old Testament saints at the end, that, uh, that, uh, they come back, tribulation saints at the end, the resurrection of them. And then it says, then come at the end, listen to how clear this is. Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. That's the end of the millennium, the end of the thousand year reign. For he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You go down to verse 14, you know what it says that is, is destroyed? It's death. It's death. Now tell me how in the world can anybody say there's not a thousand year reign of Christ? That reads their Bible. To study it out. To see if these things be so. How can anyone not see that? It's right there in plain English right in front of you. It'll be a mixture of the physical and the spiritual in that day. And people will get saved during that time. Those children for those people in the beginning, they'll get saved. It looks like in Isaiah 65, 20, they'll reach this age of accountability at 100 years old. It says, There shall no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. For the child shall die in 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be a curse. That'll be a child. It'll be 100 years old in that day. You'll go back to the way it was at Adam when they, the, the physical people grew old, old, way up in there. Right? Up towards a thousand years. I think Methuselah was almost at a thousand years. All that's coming back one day when that curse is taken away. See why you can't throw out Genesis? You can't throw out Revelation? You can't cut parts of the Word of God, folks. It all fits together. It's all lined together into one. Whew, what a day it's going to be. What a day. How do people not see it? Look here at verses 7 and nine here, seven through 9 here. The next marker we want to see the final rebellion now this is sad this is truly sad revelation 20 verse 7 and when the thousand years are expired satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall, this is the same thing he was loosed he was let go on on adam and eve and what did mankind do then this same thing and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Why? Why is Satan let out? No, I don't know. There's some things I don't know. What about you? Some things you don't know? There's some things I don't know. It doesn't seem to make sense to let Satan out again. It doesn't seem to make sense to let the devil go after all this time. But that is what God did. We all ask why quite a bit, don't we? I just know that this is the beginning of the spiritual cleansing. That's what occurs after this. But this rebellion was prophesied. Different, there's different views about this. If you go over to Ezekiel 38, it's very clear. It's talking about this same rebellion taking place. Way back there in Ezekiel. Way back there in Ezekiel. Before Christ come upon the earth. Folks, all these things fit together. All of it fits together. You can't throw one out and not have the rest. God, here's what I want us to look at here, though. God gave them all these good things. What I tell you? A perfect world. A perfect world. Everything was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful that was given to them. And yet they still rebelled. Why? Why do people bite the hand that feeds them? Why do people rebel against people that love them? Why do people go against people that, that care about them, that want to be with them? Who have you betrayed? Who have you went against? Why do people do that? Now, God's always had this problem with mankind. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 23, 3, 7. Now, you remember this verse. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. I loved you. I wanted to get you together. I wanted to get all this to happen. But you keep rebelling, even though you know I love you. You know I love you, and I care about you, and I want what's best for you. Why won't you listen to me? Why won't you pay attention to what I'm saying? I think a lot about this. <clears throat> you see, I rebelled. When I was a young man, I rebelled. I remember when I went out, I got a DUI. I've told you all about it before. And my daddy was a preacher. And my daddy uh, took a lot of trouble because of that. My mom and dad never gave me one reason to rebel. I know you all think your mom and dad's awesome. I think my mom and dad's awesome too because I think they're like the perfect family in my brain. I know they're not perfect. None of us are. But in my brain, they were just a perfect mom and dad. 
They did exactly what they were supposed to do. They loved us. They cared for us. And they did everything they could. They kept us from things. Why? Because they knew it would get us in trouble. And what did we think in my mind? In my mind, what did I think? Well, if they keep me from it, it must be something good about it. They don't really love me. They don't care about me. They want to keep me from that thing that I want so bad, not realizing that thing I wanted was going to get me in trouble. That thing I desired was going to destroy me. And I remember it very well. I was sitting there, and they, take, they took me, and they put me into a little jail cell, and I sat there in that little jail cell, and I, I waited for a moment, and I began to understand that maybe I wasn't the smart one. Maybe I wasn't the bright one. Maybe I was the villain in this story. Maybe I was the one who was doing wrong. Maybe I was the one who was making the mistake and doing wrong. And maybe I should listen to those who loved me and cared for me. Have you done that with God, folks? Have you done that with God? You should have listened. You should have listened, but you rebelled. God, I, I, I know you don't really want what's best for me. You don't really have that happy ending, do you? No, all this is just a big fantasy dream. It's all just a big fantasy dream. You don't really want what's good for me, God. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to do it on my own. I've got to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I've got to figure out what's right. I don't need to listen to you one minute. And we sound just like the fools who will be outside during this time. Thank God. Thank God got a, got a hold of me. You know, we talked the other day about how if we don't suffer chastisement, we're bastards and not sons. And then what the Scripture says, we're illegitimate. We're not really his. Thank God he, he whipped me back where I need to be, right? Any y'all ever take a good whipping? Sometimes we need it, don't we? And in this day, God will wipe out this little rebellion in the most perfect environment that can possibly imagine. People will still go against him. It's shocking, folks. Finally, here at verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I, more on that whole idea of the judgment day that's coming later. Right now, I want you to focus on this idea. The devil is the first one in. And I want you to notice something else. Hell's eternal. That, that false prophet, that beast, they're still there burning. And it's a thousand years later. It's a thousand years later and they're still in that lake of fire burning. There are people that will tell you today, hell ain't eternal. Well, these all burn up. They're telling you the beast and the false prophet. They'll be burning for a thousand years and they're still not burned up. They're still not gone. They're not eliminated. They're still there in that day. People, oh, hell isn't eternal. People, oh, there is no millennium. That's not going to happen. People are deceived. People don't read their Bibles. People don't study out to see if these be, things be so. And some people just, just don't look. They don't care. You know what? how much encouragement it gives me to know that when I'm going through the spiritual battle, I'm going through the hard time, I'm going through the struggles, that I can remember my God's got my back and He's going to get me through this. I'm going to open my eyes in the millennial kingdom and I'm going to reign. I don't know how much I'm going to reign, but I'm going to reign with Him there, right? I'm going to follow behind Him and walk behind His feet and, and see Him there in His glory, in, in His kingdom. And even after that, I'll be able to go into that eternity with Him that we're going to look at later on. Into eternity forever and ever and ever. And right now, I have to deal with a little struggle, a little trouble, a little trial, a little tribulation, a little keeping myself from a little bit of rebellion, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Jesus said, if you have ears to hear... Let him hear. Now Jesus wasn't going around preaching to a bunch of lepers that their ears had fell off, was he? Right? That wasn't what he was doing. He was preaching to people and they were closing their ears. They could not hear what he was saying. They had closed their ears where he could not, they could not hear anymore. And he was pleading with them. Listen. Listen. God wants to do great things. Listen. Listen to what He's telling you. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to come. Now is the time to live like there's a millennial kingdom that's coming down the road. Now is the time to sing joy to the world. It's going to be joy to the world. It's coming. Our Savior, our King, and our God. You have ears to hear tonight?
Virgem Rio, portanto, 